Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's panel, hosted by Signal, on the evolving roles of the CISO and the CIO. So my name is Heather Flanagan, Principal at Spherical Cal Consulting, and here on behalf of Signal. And I am thrilled to be here with an outstanding group of industry leaders who bring just, just a great wealth of experience and unique insights into this conversation. I have with me today Alvina Antar, uh, Board Director for Couchbase, Advisor to Signal, a former CIO at Okta. I, we also have Joe Sullivan. He's the CEO of Joe Sullivan Security and a former CISO, perhaps recovering, and uh, Aman Sarohi, Vice President and CISO at People AI. So we're going to dive into how the roles of the CISO and the CIO are changing with a particular focus on how those roles interact and the impact they have on organizations today. So let's get this conversation started. I'm going to start and just ask the the roles between the CISO and the CIO are, are really shifting. And as we look at how businesses are transforming, especially with all the digital acceleration that's been happening, I mean, Joe, where where do you see the roles of the CIO and the CISO headed in the next few years? And do you think that that balance is going to change? Yeah, it's really interesting. When I got into the profession, many of the security leaders I know reported to the technology leader, the CIO. And we've been evolving away from that over the last few years. It started, for me, I saw it start in startups. They were more likely to hire a first um, security leader before they hired a IT leader. And then they turned to the security leader and said, will you hire an IT person? And because a large percentage of the IT work in a startup is very focused on identity and access management, the the security leader was very happy to do that because they were already probably the person who championed implementing an, an, a single sign-on solution. And, and then they wanted to continue to oversee that. In the larger companies, it's been a slower evolution. Uh, a lot of CISOs moved out from underneath the CIO because of the recognition that the risk that the CISO had to manage was broader than the scope of the CIO, especially in tech organizations that also had a CTO and infrastructure organizations, et cetera. So it's it's like they've moved out from being in the single organization and then now they're moving back into a, sing a single organization, but like with role, with seniority flip-flopped a little bit. But even saying that, it's a generalization and and you can find lots of different configurations in, in different environments. Alvina, have you been observing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I I... I... I have seen, you know, firsthand the evolution and and the reality is, I mean, what Joe just mentioned, the need to be able to ensure that there's direct, clear accountability for for cyber and enterprise security, you know, has has dramatically evolved and shifted in ensuring that the CISO is elevated um, into the executive ranks um, so much, and and that budget is clear, uh, and that and that there isn't any any delineation in terms of um, you know, the, the level of focus and prioritization and commitment and accountability across the organization. And that is not just at the executive ranks to what, what Joe was mentioning, but it's also to the board, you know, in terms of engagement with the board, um, especially now that this is no longer just a, just a, a audit committee discussion or a larger board discussion, there's new cyber risk committees formed um, across all organizations of all sizes and the CISO is the one that's presenting. The CISO is presenting the strategy, presenting the the um, you know the, the the risks, presenting risks that are that are occurring in the industry, and 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 whether we are prone to those risks, and what we are doing to ensure that we are uh, safeguarding ourselves with depth of security. And so there's an expectation that the board is 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 knowledgeable and aware. Um, you know, regardless of whether the organization has been breached or 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 has had you know significant uh, risk exposure, so yeah, I've definitely seen that evolution. So I'm hearing a lot about you know the the strategy and how the CISOs in a way are, are moving ahead in some in some manners, but I'm also actually hearing a lot about the operations and how. Uh, the CISO role is, isn't so much just about the risk and the threats, but it's how things are being implemented and run. Aman, is that something you've observed? Yes, yeah, similar to what we just shared with each other, 
I think uh, this is a it's a tricky conversation because uh, to Joe's side, it's it's gone one way and it's flipped back around now. But one one thing I would say is uh, from a CISO perspective, reporting outside of the CIO and reporting potentially to the CEO. CEO is responsible for the company and the risk of the company, right? So brand reputation, what happens to the organization, to the customer base. So that relationship has kind of, uh, you know, you can see that that have grown in a lot of different instances where the CISO is responsible for the risk and the implementation of the risk. And then the reports to the CEO, who is also responsible, ultimately responsible for that entire suite of uh, risk area. But where it comes to implementation, I think, you know, partnering or being part of the CIO organization is also beneficial because, you can lean on some CIO's implementation expertise, right? When you are implementing some very complicated uh, advanced security features uh, and you have organizations that have, you know, 20,000, 50,000 endpoints or the you know, vast majority, partnering with that CIO or reporting to the CIO in that, or in that instance also helps because you are leaning on their expertise in that area to ensure that security is implemented accurately and effectively across the entire organization. So it's uh, I think it's evolved. Uh, I think Joe might have summarized the best where smaller organizations have adopted the CISOs because they can, you know, they can handle both sides of the coin and they report up to the CEO and they're basically working on the risk of the profile of, from the customer sense and from the brand reputation and it reports to CEO. But in, in larger organizations, I think it's still yet to be determined um, where that fits in and maybe it's a mixture of both. So. Yeah, that if I could jump in, I think that's a really great point that security leaders have a lot to learn from CIOs about the way they think. You know, as security leaders, we wake up every morning just thinking about risk. I remember the first time I had a really good dinner conversation with the CIO where he explained his passion to me. And his passion was completely different than my passion. His passion was, I'm going to use technology to make everyone in my company more efficient and more effective. You know, and, and so it didn't matter what role the person was in. He just thought, I'm going to bring technology to them and make them be able to run twice as fast. And if if security leaders are going to start taking on more of IT systems ownership, they're going to have to find that passion because that's what the company is going to want. Yeah, and just to point, to Aman's point, I mean, that that... I couldn't have articulated it better. Um, the the combination the combination of and 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 partnership and collaboration between the CISO and the CIO is critical to any any enablement. I mean, the reality is, uh, if 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 the organization isn't isn't adopting these new new capabilities and embracing and feeling as though these these capabilities are hindering their ability to be successful, you know, it looks as it it it's it 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 is it is. It is in a we're in a position where we're where where the organization is is resistant to that kind of change as opposed to embracing the change to what Joe mentioned in 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 seeing this as 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 you know everyone is responsible for for the security culture in the organization not just the CISO and the CIO every employee is responsible to secure the brand and 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 protect the organization that they're a part of. And so that's the combination of both roles and organizations are are critical to making that possible. Mm, but as soon as you, you know what I'm hearing, as soon as you start saying we're going to make people more effective in their roles, we're going to bring technology to them, we need to understand that passion. And that brings you, well, what's some of the best new technology out there today? What's got the biggest buzz? It's AI. I mean, the increased complexities of risk with AI is is a really big deal. And it does have an opportunity to bring some major efficiencies and some really complex attacks, some higher risk. What do y'all think about that? Yeah, I can take a first swing at it. So, uh, you know, we're fortunate. We're an AI company that's been around for about eight years plus, right? So we've uh, grown into a into this organization. And with the new emergence of Gen AI, that's kind of flipped the equation a lot. And what we've seen is from, you know, Fortune 100, 500, you know, uh, customers, uh, it's not just security and how you're using the safeguards of what is the security measures are in place when you're introducing new AI into the ecosystem. It's actually coming to more and hearing more about it now is AI councils, right? And I think not just AI council is just like a, just another new organization that you got to go to checklist, but it needs to be decision makers from the CIO organization, from the security organization, from the business organization, right? You need to make decision makers who are part of that organization now, because 
picking an AI product now is a new field. It's not picking a CRM product where you had a checklist and you said, yeah, this CRM, this module, works with this module, we're good to go. We'll buy this one, right? AI is becoming, like you said, an internal adoption as well as the external threat landscape has changed, right? So what we've noticed in our sense is educating our customers and our employees on the risks of AI adoption on both sides and explaining to them what are the safeguards that we need to look at it from a trust perspective from our customers, as well as from keeping our uh, our, our own company safe is, has become bigger and bigger. So we actually have an AI council that has the CIO, the CTO, uh, uh, business, and, and our legal, right? So we internally think through our organization before we go out there and talk to our customers. But I, I think that's becoming more prevalent in larger organizations very fast. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a really interesting time right now because of this. Organizations are feeling a pressure to adopt AI in some way to make their business go faster. It's what the board's asking them about when they come in for their board meeting. The board's not asking about security this year. They're asking, how are you implementing AI so that we don't get smoked by our competitors? And so there's this pressure inside organizations that's not too different from a decade ago when the pressure was how are you how are you moving to saas and the and cloud so that we can cut costs and not get left behind and beaten by our competitors and we saw what happened 10 years ago we had this whole emergence of shadow it that was the bane of existence for the security team and led to marginalization of the cio because a lot of technology just moved out of their organization and what I worry about right now is that too many organizations uh, are put, you know, CIO and CISO are putting their head in the sand and saying, you know, no, we're not doing AI or I'm not the AI expert, so I don't want to get involved. If I'm speaking to a room of 100 security executives, I'll ask how many of you are taking on the AI at your company to manage the risk? Only half of them raise their hand right now and the other half are not jumping in. If they don't jump in, who's going to manage the risk? That's what's scary. It is scary. Avina, have, what have you been hearing in, at the board level? Yeah, I mean, the 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 reality is, is exactly what Joe mentioned. That is the first question around not only AI within products and driving innovation within within products, uh, but also within the enterprise in in driving you know just increased efficiencies um, and and just resilience and and so. You know, and it's and it's 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 building your own AI capabilities, and as well as using enterprise enterprise SaaS products uh, that that are extending AI uh, within their products. And so, you know, we can't be in a position to what Joe just mentioned back in the days with the cloud. Like, yes, we were resistant, but the reality is, cloud is here, and 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 everyone across every industry of every size embraced the cloud, and and those that haven't are. Are are struggling, um, you know, in, in in terms of in terms of growth, and yeah. we're in the same boat with AI, and and I think that CIOs realize that, and CISOs realize that that you know I'm shocked that only half half of those those individuals in the room are actually raising their hand because of what we experienced back in the cloud days, and the emergence of SaaS, you know, you know we've learned, um, and I think that AI is 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 now even a greater opportunity for us to embrace, but embrace with caution, you know, and 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 really understand, um, you know, what are we doing to be able to have monitoring capabilities um, and and really understand, you know, what 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 technologies, um, whether they're they're in-house enterprise technologies or or built technologies, the enterprise is using. We can't be in a position where we hold back the business. The reality is the business is going to adopt these technologies whether we like it or not. And so, you know, shadow 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 IT is now, you know, you know, exasperated with AI, and 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 we we need to be in a position, you know, to to really embrace this new capability, and 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 be in a position where we safeguard our organization and and drive true innovation in the organization. So, uh, and then and then on the other front, in terms of you know AI enhanced cyber attacks, um, you know the the level of of of, of attacks and the scale and speed of attacks have increasingly, you know, have, have grown increasingly exponential because of AI. And so we need to be in a position where we're really thinking about, like, talk about defense in depth, um, you know, the need to be able to, 
to, to, to think about how we are using AI to, to defend ourselves against the level of complexities of attacks is another vector that, that CIOs and CISOs are, are thinking through. So you are hearing so many, you know, an increase in threats just by sheer number. Um, we're also hearing a demand for an increase in efficiency and uh, across the entire organization, which feels like that's going to drive some interesting competition for budget. Because if everybody's supposed to be more efficient and everyone in in the company as a whole is responding to all these threats, then you've got you've got a demand for resources that everyone's going to be asking for. So how how do you see that playing out? How do you see that that uh, that allocation starting to split between the CIO, the CISO, possibly the rest of the organization? Well, you know, a business lead. Business leaders are looking at this as an opportunity, and I think that the security leaders need to as well. Too often, security looks at what the business is doing and just figures out, how do I slow that down because it's bad? But this the emergence of AI is kind of like the emergence of, of GDPR and the privacy requirements that came about a decade ago, where organizations all of a sudden needed to care more about where the data was. Right now, everybody cares where the data is because you want to use the data to build your, you know, to enhance your models. And so now the, the security leader can look and see there are other people here who are looking to figure out where all the data is. This is great. I remember when I, you know, when I was the only one who was trying to find all the copies of the data in all the corners of the enterprise. Now everybody else wants to find all the data in all the corners of the enterprise so that they can use it and that'll make it easier for us to secure it if we are along for that ride. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say just, you know, it it has budget discussions, because it's now a board level conversation, budget discussions are completely different, um, where the, the board is actually asking how much investment are we putting in risk management? And it's no longer being looked at as a cost center, um, you know, and, 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 and how much we're investing in security capabilities, but, but what are we doing to invest in, in ensuring that we're managing our risk across the organization because of reputational damage, whether it's whether the organization has experienced that or they've seen in the industry the impact of reputational damage to, to, the, to the company and their brand and fines and, and disruptions across the organization, the board and the executive team across the CFO, you know, the COO across the organization is really thinking about you know, what is needed to be able to drive and ensure that we are allocating budget and that it's not just sitting within a CIO or, or CISO's budget, you know, and, and, and it's that, that we're allocating budget specifically towards risk management um, and, that, and that we're able to track and measure clear outcomes based on specific, um, you know, budget allocation. The one thing I, I, yeah. So one thing I can share on this is that the budget is uh, is getting also easier to kind of defend in both ways. And I'll tell you, and I'll give you the analogy. We already knew, and you know, all of us in security will always raise their hand. We were already struggling to find the right resources with security skill sets. Now it's gotten more complex. Now you got to find an individual who's got a security security skill set with an AI background, right? And now, I mean, now it's getting more complex and finding the right resources for the right reasons for your organization. There will AIs. Embracing AI is going to take will help us in some efficiencies that we might have to repurpose employees into different areas. But at the same time, we might need to go find a more skilled employee or a set of employees to support your AI security CIO uh, uh, initiatives, right? So I think that conversation in the budget sense has gotten easier because the board wants to go do AI. They want to make sure you're, you're protecting the company. And you're adopting it, but then you then you have to actually go find resources who have that kind of very unique skill set. Before finding and you know aging ourselves, I used to work at MCI back in the day. If I go find an IT guy, that was easy. Like a IT guy, it was easy to find an IT person that can build you a CRM from SAP to Oracle or a, any of those, right? But now it's not easy to find someone with that skill set. So I think the budget conversation has gotten easier, but it's because gotten easier in my sense because you can point to the skill sets that you are lacking or you need to go, go get because of the way advanced of AI and security has become. So having budget become, in a, in a way, a little easier to argue for is a good thing. Uh, and I think that reputational component of it is 
is so important <laughs> uh, where it was, wasn't something I think people used to think about until they the regulators came in, the fines came in, the no, you actually have to disclose when you have an incident came in. Mm -hmm. So we let's talk about that brand. Let's talk about security as a brand protector and how the CISO or the CIO might might need to have different ways to resolve that. You know, it's, it feels like right, it feels like right now we're doing a little bit of an A/B test of uh, whether security adds something to your brand or not. Because on the one hand, you are seeing a bunch of companies that are creating new roles called chief trust officer or, or things like that, and it's kind of a it's kind of like another level of elevation for that security leader because it it becomes external facing and. It's a recognition that the, that that type of company believes that security is important to their brand, but I'm also seeing at the same time other public companies that have essentially eliminated the chief security officer or top trust officer role, and are kind of pushing security back into the background. And I I can't figure out what's going on with this total dichotomy. Other than I see the trust officer role emerging in in companies that are are technology companies and they want to make sure that people understand that they're commit they're committed to protecting the technology but the reality is every company is adopting ai right now and every company has a bunch of risk because they're holding a lot of our data so it's an interesting time i think every company is a technology company at some at some level yeah and yeah, i think every company should be a security company i mean the reality is regardless of you know, we said every company is a technology company. Now everyone's going to be a, every company is an AI company. I mean, even even those not like people that, that, that AI that was born as an AI company are claiming to be AI companies with AI capabilities. If you know whether they have it or not is is a is a different discussion. But um, you know that that is that is causing uh, you know the the evolution of 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 security to being that much more critical. You know, because the need to be able to to in order to adopt these new capabilities, you know, you we need to make sure that they're secure, um, that they're securing our data, our IP, our our you know our customer data, our employee data, and our intellectual property. I think, and 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 so, I just you know I I continue to um, see see security being more of a cultural shift in an organization where companies are are really wanting. Um, you know, to to you know the same way companies think about customers as their top priority, and loving our customers is our number one one number one priority, or customer focus or customer first is our number one priority. Well, the security of our customers, the trust of our customers, is the only way that we can truly love our customers. Uh, and so, it's a cultural shift, you know, where every, which is why I was saying, where every employee should feel accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, that the CISO is the one that's driving that brand and that cultural shift across the organization. It, to piggyback off that, I think Elvira, really, you said it best earlier. Uh, we all heard the saying, right? You know, it takes a village to raise a child. And, you know, you know that. I think it takes the entire village of an organization to be security experts, right? From our organization, it's everyone from the AE to the SE to the data analytics person to the security organization everyone has to be locked in and you are basically protecting the organization at every in every situation right so if you get an email phishing at uh, 10th right you're coming in you as an ae or an sc or a marketing team member anyone you have to be vigilant to make sure that you are clicking on the right links right because your brand reputation is everything at this point especially if you are an ai company or you're a growth growth company one of the things that we talk about internally in our organization is bring security to the forefront don't play defense, right? When you meet meet a customer, share with them your security posture. Be be up, up, up front about it because you're building trust. You're building trust in layers with every customer, right? The more conversations you have, the more the more you share with them about your security posture, how you're taking on AI. You're helping them educate them as well as showing them that you belong in this conversation. And that comes in from the culture perspective, right? So we talked about having a culture that has to start from every level of the organization, every conversation with the customer, and then your security team members, your CISO, your CI organizations will support the entire initiative, right? So it does have to be a, a culture shift that has to start from the top to the bottom. And it has to be from the day you join the company, because if it's not there, then that's where you get popped. Someone leaves something loose out there. And then that's where brand reputation gets hurt. And 
you know, once it gets hurt and uh, just fines are, you know, the amount of dollars you can't even put it behind it to repair the damage. It's uh, what I think the expression I've heard is, you know, never let uh, an emergency fail to be an opportunity. So let, let's let's bring some of this down to some some real examples. Now, I know you'll need to to be a little fuzzy about them, but I'd, I'd actually like to hear some of your war stories. Some of the things that are you've you've seen these security incidents in your in your areas, how the CIOs, the CISOs, how how the company basically came together to deal with it or not. What can you tell me? Amon, go ahead. You start. Yeah, I can start off this one. So, you know, we're fortunate. Uh, People.ai is a Ukrainian founded company. Um, our founder, Oleg, and our employees were, you know, based in Ukraine. Uh, a lot of employees were based out here in the U.S. and they had family and friends in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, a few years back, it was unfortunate times where we were in the midst of a war and we still are with uh, Russia crossing the borders, right? And it was happening at lightning speed, right? I mean, we had intel from our team members because they had families who were living in the country and they could talk to you over, you know, text and WhatsApp and tell you like CNN would say that, oh, the tanks are crossing the border. I was like, that's like eight hours ago. Like the tanks already crossed the borders. Like we already knew that this was already an imminent war to happen. And this was a true test for me as a CISO, uh, as an organization, our CTO, and our IT organization to come together and come up with a plan on on real in real time, right? There's no playbooks, right? I mean, Joe, you've been in the CISO in a couple of companies. We've gone through the, you know, here's a crypto playbook, here's a ransomware playbook. There's no playbook to go fight with Mother Russia. Like it's literally teaming together, believing in the company, believing in what's important uh, in the organization. And I can tell you there were instances where we had to write scripts overnight to have ready on our end to press the button to disable every laptop in certain regions instantly, right? Because at a certain point, they're fight, fighting and fighting for your lives, right? And at a certain point, you have to have humanity first and you have to say, look, you want to give them, you want to keep your employees safe, get them out, uh, out of the area so they can be safe and they can be taken care of. We evacuated everyone. We have been successful in keeping people in different areas that they felt comfortable in doing so. But at the same time, I think our customers leaned on us and realized how important we were taking our employee safety as well as our customers data and you know two years we've you know look forward we fast forward some of this our customers are very you know thankful for the ways we approached it thankful for the advanced security features we added on to our our our, our platform and i think it was a, a true sign of leadership coming together to uh you know be in the forefront of a war type scenario as well as you know come out of it looking stronger and still protecting our employees and, and our brand at the same time. Yeah. I've, I've been to, I've been to Ukraine four times in the last year and a half myself doing humanitarian work. And one of the things that I find every time I go to Ukraine is that, you know, there was, a, there's a large uh, in, uh, population of people who work for uh, American companies in technology roles. And they all have this, um, amazing appreciation for what organizations like people did in terms of stepping up and helping their employees during that time of crisis. And, uh, it, what you, what you went through must've been insane. And it's amazing, uh, the way you were able to put your employees first. I, I mean, another example that every company had to go through, there was a variation of that with a little less drama was the pandemic. For me, that was, I think of the beginning of the pandemic as one of the best times of partnership I ever had with the CIO. I was, you know, I was, I was the CSO at Cloudflare when the pandemic started and, you know, the head of HR, the CIO, the CTO and myself, we, we talked nonstop, you know, the, the chat of the four of us, we became a committee that kept the company running, even though nobody could go to the office and people weren't necessarily prepared to work from home full time. You had to make a lot of decisions really quickly to put employees first and, and manage risk. And I guess it's any one of these crisis situations that are the best opportunities to build relationships. We just got to figure out how to get those relationships without the crisis and it'd be, be great. That would be nice. <laughs> Alvina, what have you seen at the board level? Yeah, I am. Um... I 
I thank you for sharing that, Aman uh, and Joe. I, I I just wanted to share, um, you know, just in 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 my time at Okta, uh, you know, just we 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 had a lot of discussions at the board. It was actually that was when we introduced the new risk committee. Uh, in 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 terms of you know just the focus of of risk at Okta and ensuring that you know not only are we a security company but um, you know we are we are focusing on security as our number one company initiative and actually pausing uh, product innovation all in the name of security as we were talking about budget I mean there was a a time where we actually paused and we 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 communicated um, you know to all of our customers in the industry the need to be able to focus on security and pause pause innovation um and and the importance of you know really looking at our product portfolio as our com- customers are 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 um are you know partnering with us to drive their security posture and harden their posture um through identity first security you know really looking at you know it was an evolution of 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 our of our IGA and our PAM our privileged access capability um, uh, you know, was 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 really an evolution of that of that product strategy to be able to actually put privileged access behind Okta, which is what all of our customers, um, you know, were are are needing. Um, and 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 you know, the evolution of that actually with Signal is is a huge opportunity for us to actually think about like why the importance of privileged access um, and 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 how complex um, you know organizations. Uh, access across their secrets. You know, secrets are. We, you know, we had to go through and 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 assess all the secrets across the organization, and 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 that reinforced the importance of really understanding secrets across every device, every account, every endpoint, um, whether they're in your perimeter or beyond your perimeter, and 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 really focusing on um, you know privileged access and IGA. And and phishing resistant factors, which is which was you know the evolution of our product strategy, and um, and and really thinking about who else we need to partner with to drive increased depth of security within our organization, not just for us but for our customers. Those that was the serious question. Now I'm going to ask the less serious question. So I mean, sometimes the CIOs and CISOs have somewhat different priorities. Let's say which can lead to uh, entertaining situations. Have, have any of you had like memorable or funny moments where these differences came to a head and presumably got resolved? Yeah, I think one of the interesting ones is is over um, identity and access management. And it's, it's, a, um, it's where I often see the tension most between security and the CIO because... Um, it's starting to become more of a tug of war. It used to be that the security leader was fine with IT running uh, identity and access management, but then you know they would want to make recommendations. But if you look at the world right now, ninety something percent of all of our security compromises involve an identity compromise, and so the security team really wants to get into the weeds of identity and access management, and the CIO. It's kind of like we got this, you know, we're the team that understands how to keep the system running 24 hours a day. We got to make sure our employees can get in and do their work. And you've, you're not allowed to come fiddle with the controls. Uh, we're we're going to have it, you know, so that it's, it's a, um, it's an interesting situation right now where there's definitely more tension in this corner of the tech stack than I think most others. The, the way we've, we've kind of approached this is, We've kept the, uh, you know, the access of the like the building blocks, right? The table stakes with IT, and any advanced capabilities that we add on to that. So we, you know, we're I'm actually a customer of Signal, and we've implemented them across our AWS infrastructure, uh, across the S3 buckets. We own that piece of it, right? So we are we're tug of war is there, <laughs> very much evident. Uh, but we've learned to kind of say, look, okay, look, you're going to play the, you, you, you guys will be the safeguards, the building blocks. You're going to have the firewalls. You're going to have the octas. You're going to have that in, on your end. But any of the advanced capabilities that we bring in, because we want to protect our customer data at all costs, we want to mi- uh, minimize the risk exposure, right? So once in an event someone is breached, you basically want to put in the guardrails to uh, minimize your, uh, your risk exposure there. What you want to do is have that capability and have that advanced security uh, knowledge 
within the security landscape. So we'll actually go partner with them. And then we know that this is going to be, you know, sitting on top of Okta. We as security experts will be the sole authority of who gets access, how they get access, who gets even access to those consoles, because you need to have the checks and balances in place, right? You can't you can't have IT uh, or IT organization just owning who gets access when they want access. You want security have to have some lens. So the way we've kind of found that happy medium ground today is we're adding on technologies or advanced capabilities on top of our table stakes, and we're letting IT and own the table stakes, and we're spending more time with the advanced security parts of the, the organization. I, I wouldn't call this. Uh, you know, I was thinking about your your question. At I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it funny, but you know, the dynamic, when I first walked in, you know, four years ago, my, my, my conversation with the CISO was, was, you know, we, we, you know, what was that we're partners and it wasn't just, you know, a, you know, a, a, a light discussion. It was the only way we're going to be successful is if we really operate at an executive level as partners. And, and I don't see that often. Um, uh, in, in the industry. And I think that, you know, even just examples that Iman mentioned, like you can't be successful in implementing across every employee globally across the enterprise with, you know, with enterprise, you know, cyber, cyber risks, if you don't operate that way, you know, and if you, if at the top, I mean, really, you know, and you have that level of alignment, if you operate in a way where security feels that like, operates as, as they're the strategic, you know, decision maker, and they don't involve IT in in even assessing the technologies, and then they and then they're handed the technology and 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 told to deploy. Then there's constant friction. You know they don't feel accountable. They didn't select the technology. Um, they 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 don't feel like they they own the success of that technology. And so you know you know in truly I mean talk about collab. We always talk about collaboration and partnership, um, and they seem like. You know buzzwords, but the reality that's that's the only way you're going to be successful is if you operate in that way, um, truly and openly and genuinely and transparently. And then the entire organization feeds from that from that culture and from uh, you know and 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 that's that's what success looks like. Uh, and so, um, you know, to me, that's the environment that I think we should all embrace. I think that's that. I I used to uh, I come out of the higher education. Uh, environment and the IAM departments in central IT regularly bounced from one department to the next. It just depended on who was having the most annoying problem. Was it the HR system? At which point, no, no, identity belongs in uh, the administrative IT group. No, no, wait, we had a big security incident. Quick, move it into the security office. No, no, there's actual infrastructure like directory services and whatnot. Move it into the infrastructure team because it's core. And it just it just kept moving around for years and years. Never did find a proper home, I don't think. Yeah, it's the same way like with uh, product management, you know, the the waffling of product management between product and and marketing and go to market, right? I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it shouldn't matter actually. The reality is if we operate as a partnership. You know, should it should it really matter? Like, if we have the right level of focus and clarity of accountability. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. You're right. Well, that does bring me. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I, I just think that's such a good point that if if there's, it shouldn't matter if there's partnership, but it's also it shouldn't matter if the people have the ability to look at it from the perspective of the customer or for the, from the perspective of the CEO even. Like I always think about how the CEO has all these different teams that are just focused on their corner of the business and not thinking about everything holistically. All of us have to learn to think like a CEO about, okay, operational efficiency and excellence is important and so is managing risk. Everybody wants to grow up to be a real leader that's that's where you start is trying to empathize with the other functions inside your organization and and collaborate with them and and walk in their shoes and i mean to that point joe just that's why the earlier stage companies they that it, you know they have that they have that as part of their values right builders and owners and empower empowerment you know to operate as a ceo you know we actually passed around a ceo hat you know and and thought as a ceo um, but the later stage, you know, you know, the larger you are, the harder it is to maintain that culture. And that's the, that's the challenge is how do we maintain 
you know, the, even at scale, maintain that level of culture of, of, of you know, empowerment um, and, and, and thinking as a CEO, not just thinking about your, your, your bubble, uh, but operating as a, as, as a CEO and as, as, as a customer and as a board member. I'm thinking of that from when, when you don't know that you're a tech company, a university, for example, right? The, the, the CEO of the university, that's the president or that's the provost, but that's, that's, that's a person who, um, you know, they they recognize that the mission is education and research. So getting them to understand that, yes, but technology is so core to what you do is often a struggle. And I think we may find that in some of the enterprises of the world as well, where they, they do not want to think like a tech company. And so they don't, they leave the, the uh, disengagement and the lack of relationships to be a thing. But that's why, you know, thanks for mentioning that. I, that's why I think that we'll continue to see technology leaders and security leaders continue to evolve as business leaders. Like those technology and security leaders that operate as a business strategic leader will continue to evolve in roles like COOs and even CEOs. Um, you know, and 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 I and I and I do believe we saw that evolution with 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 the cloud and digital um, you know evolution, and then now with AI, the 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 importance of increased depth of expertise in technology and data and security will continue allow to allow for the evolution of of these roles into the top seat. Truth, truth. All right, so I have one last question for you all. And it does kind of build on on what we've been talking about. So big picture, based on what you see, not just within your own companies, but across the landscape, are we actually moving to better collaboration between CIOs and CISOs? Or is there still tension that we're, we just need to rip apart and fix? Aman, I'm looking at you first. All right. So, you know, Alina said it best earlier. Um, I think the smaller organizations have definitely embraced it. Uh, we are an eight-year-old organization, right? And, and I've come across a lot of the startups and, you know, mature companies, even the two, 3,000 employee companies. They've embraced it fully. I came from Guidewire, uh, fully embraced. Um, and it is uh, something that you can see the paying off dividends. You can see it pay off dividends. And, you know, when you are at a critical point, when you have, might have a breach or you're, you know, in our case, we were at war with Mother Russia. We we're talking to about a customer, a customer-specific issue. IT, security, we just jump in together, we solve the problem, we move on. Um, I do think the Fortune 500 organizations have a larger initiative in their hands. I think they really have to change their culture, change the way they're thinking, because the, for them to keep up with, with the emergence of AI, right? You're gonna they're going to force you to work together. It, it, it is actually going to be a catalyst for you to work together because if you don't work together, you're going to be uh, you're going to you're going to, you're going to trip over an AI evolution and the implementation of AI or securing AI because you guys are not talking to each other, right? So I do believe there's a change happening. I think there's a much more important change that will need to happen in the Fortune 500 companies or Fortune 100 companies. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. Although even in the large companies, it's hard to generalize. I I I, I think the question you asked. Um, or the observation you had about higher education could be extended to any of the any large company. And I do a lot of consulting projects with different companies. And sometimes I go in and it surprises me because there's no technology leader on the executive leadership team of the company. And I, I spent most of my career working inside technology companies. And so the idea that the CTO and the CIO weren't in regular conversations with the CEO was like a shock to me, but in there are large organizations that don't think of themselves as technology organizations and technology is just a service function. And I think those organizations, those executive leadership teams, they need a technology leader in the room with them, helping them understand how technology can help them go faster and empower them. And also, you know, explain the risks uh, that, you know, it, that are, being incurred already in their in their servant technology organization. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, what I would say is I'm an I'm an eternal optimist, and um, and so 
my feeling is, is that that partnership and that collaboration, especially with the emergence of AI, um, will, will prevail because that is, that is, that is the only way that we can be successful. Um, and that, and, and, and we will need to, you know, operate, uh, hand in hand. Uh, and that's the way our teams will operate because that's the only way we can implement transformative, you know, capability across the organization. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm an optimist that, that every company across every industry, um, and every size, um, will, 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 will embrace, you know, the, the, the need for this, for this partnership and the need to be able to ensure that there's technology and security expertise, you know, at the executive level. And there we go. Aman, Albina, Joe, thank you so much for uh, entertaining all of these questions and sharing the stories that you did. We greatly appreciate it. And thanks to everybody that's been listening in. Uh, hope to have you listen in to us again later. <laughs>